Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning show. So happy to have you with us this morning. We're broadcasting on Channel 9, as well as live streaming on Port Media's YouTube channel at www.ncmhub.org. Just click on the YouTube icon. I'm your host, Mary Jacobson, and I'm so delighted to welcome today's guest. First, I'm going to have Jill Moran, Newburyport High School te science teacher, and she's here to discuss scientific literacy with us what it is, why it matters, if we're ever going to be, so be able to solve urgent problems like the pandemic and climate change, in some ways maybe all of us can increase our scientific literacy. And then in the second half of the show, I'm so pleased to welcome author Edith Maxwell and historian Sam Bailey, both members of the Amesbury Friends Meeting House, and they're going to teach us about Quaker history and values, and in particular, the link between Quaker spirituality and activism. But first, let me welcome Jill. Jill, thank you so much. I'm so happy to have you here on The Morning Show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to talk about science. Wonderful. Well, this is your third time on The Morning Show. That makes yeah. you a super friend of The Morning <laughs> Show, and I'm so appreciative of it. Well, you know, Jill, I... I I immediately thought of getting you on the show um, when I was thinking about how much misinformation and misinterpretation there's been in the news and also especially social media in response to the pandemic, just as there has been for a much longer amount of time in regards to climate change. And so I was really pleased when you were willing to come on the show and give us a refresher on how science actually works. So I wanted to start though by asking you a little bit about what was it that made you decide that you wanted to focus on studying science in general and beyond that what made you focus on biology great question well i think it started at you know from a child we're all kind of born scientists in a way we're all <laughs> oh i like the way you put that <laughs> <laughs> we are it's true we're yeah. naturally curious creatures and i grew up um, on the coast of maine and always exploring outside i spent a lot of time outside playing, um, going to the beaches, tide pooling. And then in school, for whatever reason, at my where I went for um, education, there wasn't a lot of science available to me. Mm. And then in high school, I really started to enjoy it. And then uh, when I went off to college, I still didn't know what I wanted to do, but I um, started to lean towards teaching and then I thought um, I had narrowed it down to math and science yeah. and I said well what's always changing and dynamic and exciting and new discoveries science and that's where uh, I want to be. <laughs> so, well that's a great way to put it it is always changing and growing and developing. Yes yes so. And what, what about biology in particular? Uh, I I really, I loved animals and animal behavior, uh, studying that, and then just anything um, genetics was really intriguing to me. So I had a lot of different interests in that focused in biology. Of course, I had to take chemistry and physics, but my heart definitely gravitated towards biology. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm glad that it did. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to start by asking you um, uh, if you could just uh, define scientific literacy for us and, and say a little bit about why it's important. It's extremely important. Um, one, because it's very powerful. It really empowers a person if they can take information, take facts, make their own conclusions that are unbiased and um, from media outlets and make informed decisions for themselves, mm -hmm. for their family, for their community, for our country when they go to mm -hmm. vote on different scientific issues. So mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important for, yeah. for all of us to be scientific, scientifically literate. And of course, we're, we're naturally um, born little scientists. So yeah. we should continue that through, um, you know, childhood, adulthood, and, and all stages of life. So another way to put that was we can reawaken that childhood curiosity and interest in the world around us and making careful observations about it, though, not assumptions about it, but making careful observations about it. Right. So, I think, well, uh, yeah, being able to 
make observations and then inferences based on yeah. those observations, but not yeah. necessarily opinions. Right, big difference. <laughs> well, along those lines, then, Jill, frequently we'll hear um, on the news or other forms of media that, especially in response to the pandemic, that we should consult credible sources is the phrase that's used all the time. Yes. But it occurs to me it might be often that advice comes without informing people about how to determine what a credible source is. And so you could provide a huge public service, I think, just by educating us about how an average person goes about assessing what is a credible source. Okay, well, I hope I do justice to all the librarians <laughs> out there. <laughs> uh, I would say um, you want to make sure that whatever article or documentary or video that you're watching online, because there's so much information out yeah. there on the internet available to us that um, there's a reference list to the article mm. that, um, you know, they, they provide sources that they receive their information from. So um, sites that have a .org, a .edu um, would be probably better to being a credible source. And mm -hmm. then obviously you can use the library uh, websites and mm -hmm. they do have search engines that search, you know, just credible sources. Also available to everyone is Google Scholar. So oh. if you're looking for a scientific article or a journal, mm -hmm. um, you can access that. You can at least read the abstract. Um, yeah. Information and, da and data is very valuable these days. So yeah. some of the articles you would have to pay for um, or be on a searchable database that's being paid for by someone else. Mm -hmm. But it is available mm -hmm. to, to the general public. You can dig, you can, you can be a researcher and find mm -hmm. The credible sources mm -hmm. and then also I would just say um, you know tried and true National Geographic Scientific American um, they really do their research and then take those high-level scientific journals boil it down for um, for people and they have extensive reference mm -hmm. lists okay so, well, that's very helpful. So the references that you mentioned means there'd be footnotes that, that show that the person actually did research, um, yes. that it's not just raw opinion. And yes. then the .org or the .edu suggests it's, kind of, it's an educational institution or an institute or nonprofit of some kind that wouldn't have a vested interest um, in the outcome, hopefully. And then right. Google Scholar is a great idea. And I yeah. like the way, yeah, we're all going to have to, I think, become our own researchers um, mm -hmm. and verify our, 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 our sources. Thanks, Jill. That's very helpful. Yes. Um, and another phrase that gets used uh, a lot is uh, peer reviewed. Um, sometimes there will be reporting about um, an article, a new medication or something, um, or a shift in tactics um, that's been tested. But on the news, they'll say, They'll add the caveat, but it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. And so, and, off, and again, often they don't say what that means or why it's important or how that should shift mm -hmm. our assessment of the credibility of the information that we're getting. So another public service that you can provide yeah. us right here and now is just clarify, what does that mean to say it hasn't been peer reviewed yet? What makes peer review important and what difference should that make in how we assess the credibility of an article that we may be hearing about? Great question. So I would say if it has been peer reviewed, it's definitely more credible because um, if you're a scientist, a virologist, and you're studying viruses and you do an experiment <clears throat> and a study, and then you publish um, or you write a paper, before it's published, other experts around the world are going to read this study, read this experiment, mm -hmm. and look to see is the data showing the trends that they're finding uh, and they they are allowed to discuss it and um you know attest it and say mm -hmm. you know i don't think that this was done right or you know so it's peer-reviewed that means multiple experts in that field 
have read the study and agree with the findings. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's uh, another uh, kind of thick, incredible layer um, yeah. of um, assessment that these findings fit with other data that we're busy looking at, and so we think this is this is this is reviewed by the pe by scientific peers. <laughs> yeah. So okay, that's very helpful. Thank First you, Jim. Our field, yes, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, another thing I was wanting to ask you about has to do with sometimes the shift in expert opinion um, mm -hmm. that can change um, from one month to the next or sometimes even one week to the next. Most, no, most notably, we all remember that in the beginning of the pandemic, we were told, um, oh, the only people that need to wear masks are people who are symptomatic. Um, and then it obviously changed over time to expanding the field of, of people who should be wearing masks. I mean, we're exhaling um, uh, water vapor all the time, <laughs> you know, and that's how the virus travels. But I think that shift um, in what was recommended from the beginning to about masks is just one example. In the beginning, they were saying that children uh, were not vulnerable to the virus, and obviously that's not completely true. In fact, there was a particularly um, uh, uh, a very intense set of symptoms uh, uh, similar to Kawasaki syndrome, I think, that some children have died from. And then the symptoms themselves to look out for shifted over time from initially a fever and a cough to now we've all heard the expression COVID toes, for example, yeah. and also um, things like a loss of taste or smell. And I think sometimes people hearing these shifts um, wonder, why is this? Um, do the scientists, are they disagreeing with one another? Are we getting different opinions from different scientists in different weeks? Or at the, at the, the, the worst end of speculation is maybe they just don't know what they're talking about. So Jill, help us understand some of these shifts that we've all witnessed over the, over the weeks about um, different information about the pandemic and how to protect ourselves from it. Right. Um, so I, I would say first and foremost, this is a brand new virus that mm -hmm. has never entered um, the human population before. There have been other viruses similar to this, um, SARS, um, but this is brand new. And I think one of the first names that came out was novel coronavirus, mm -hmm. meaning new, uh, corona meaning it looks like um, a crown. Yeah. So lot there's about 200 viruses that can infect humans and mm -hmm. they've been studied uh tremendously for mm -hmm. years and years this is a brand new virus so mm -hmm. um yes yeah, scientists understand how viruses are transmitted how they replicate um trans but they don't know transmission rates how um how infectious it is so i think that's why we were seeing a lot of, um, you know, different pieces to the puzzle because they're they're trying to learn. Yeah. It's so new. It's never entered humans before that they know of, and it's only been studied in labs prior. Mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a, you know, scientists also had a learning curve, and you can yeah. study a virus in the lab, but it's very different outside with the epidemiology of our of our country and the world so well that's interesting what you're underlining is um literally the novelty of, of this virus and that i like the way you put it scientists have their learning curve too um but they are scientists and so what they're doing is forming a knowledge base um, by doing careful observations. So it doesn't mean that they're disagreeing with one another. It means that they're learning more as they go. Um, and I guess the good news from what you're saying is that as they learn more as they go, they share it with us. And then our job is to make sure it's a credible source. <laughs> and then as we ascertain that it's a credible source, to be grateful that they have learned more. Because the more we learn about the virus, the more effectively we can protect ourselves from it. Looks like you were going to say something there, Jill. Oh, I was just going to add. And so you have scientists learning along the way. And then there's politics. So. Oh, my word. I yes, did. constantly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, that, that you know, to what extent that plays a role, um, we may never know behind the yeah. scenes, decisions that yeah. are 
made for the powers that be. Um, but I, it definitely is scientists learning along the way and then policy. And this is our first major pandemic. So yeah, everybody. in our yeah. lifetimes, for sure. Absolutely. And, and politics, no matter where, what your politics are, um, is not a science. <laughs> <laughs> safe to say. <laughs> so there can be opinions <laughs> and politics provides, I think, often a filter, but not a credible source in terms of scientific accuracy, <laughs> fair right. to say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So I would like to ask you if you could help us understand uh, the difference between a virus and bacteria, because I think there's been confusion about that along the way too. And, yeah. and science and, and, and medicine in particular deal in very different ways with viruses than they do with bacteria. So yeah. another public service, Joe, <laughs> yeah. one after the other here. So help us understand better scientifically how viruses are different from bacteria and how they are therefore dealt with differently by science and by medicine. Sure. This is where I would love to put up a graphic of <laughs> oh. bacteria, but I will explain it the best I can. So, um, and we teach this in ninth grade biology uh, in the, the entire state does for Massachusetts, I'm sure of the country, but uh, for viruses, they are not considered a living entity mm. because they cannot reproduce on their own. They're uh, smaller than bacteria physically. Um, they can be, uh, the genetic material inside could be DNA or RNA. Um, and they just, they need a host, uh, i.e. humans, you know, some sort of animal. Um, there's viruses that even can attack bacteria. Oh. They're all different uh, life forms. Okay. And when I read this, I was um, blown away. There are more viruses, a hundred million times more viruses than there are stars in the universe. Oh my. So, <laughs> it's a, they're tiny galaxies. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I know. That was, um, that was a really interesting fact yeah. that I learned when I was studying up for this. And um, I heard another lecture where a professor was saying, if you took a teaspoon of ocean water um, and drank it, there would be 2 million different viruses just in that teaspoon of water. Oh my so they goodness. They are all around us. Yeah. Um, but in order to treat a virus, you need an antiviral. An mm -hmm. antibiotic is not going to work. Antibiotics specifically target bacteria. Mm, okay. And Humans, we have about 10,000 species of bacteria that are living in and mm -hmm. on our body mm -hmm. um, in a symbiotic relationship. So when we get a bacteria that is non-sympathetic or you know, bad yeah. for us and we need to take an antibiotic and we get an infection, when you go to the doctor, they, they typically recommend that you um, either take a probiotic yeah. while you're taking the antibiotic or um, you eat yogurt or something that has living bacteria in it. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the antibiotic, it's going through your digestive system. It's going to destroy all good and bad bacteria. Uh. Um, but bacteria can live on their own. They don't need a host. We share our habitat with, you know, our body with bacteria, but they're mm -hmm. also everywhere mm -hmm. on earth. Mm -hmm. So yeah. viruses cannot reproduce on their own without a host mm -hmm. and bacteria can. So their bacteria consider living viruses are not. Okay. Um, would it be accurate to describe a virus as a parasite then on a host or, or not? It is a parasitic uh, relationship, uh -huh. although parasites are their own type of organism. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's just so, um, for a non-living thing, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> barely alive, um, they're so abundant 
Yeah. It's obviously a strategy yeah. <laughs> evolutionarily that has worked in viruses' uh, uh, behavior, uh, uh, behalf rather, um, but they're incredibly powerful, I guess, because they are able then to infect a host and then reproduce based on uh, the material that they're able to gather from their host. Mm -hmm. um, so that raises an, another question, um, which has to do with how we survive them. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, Jill, was about how do vaccines work? I mean, we know that they're busy working all over the planet right now on trying to come up with a vaccine for this virus. So, um, and we hear about that on the news, but we hear less about how a vaccine works and, and mm -hmm. people talk on the news about researchers going through different steps. Mm -hmm. um, but could you help us understand better what it is that they're looking for um, and what is the process that needs to be gone through to come up with a vaccine that will be safe? Absolutely. So vaccines are just one tool that we have to treat viruses. So people should keep that in mind. Um, um, so there's, you know, biologics they can inject into patients, mm. the, um, vaccines, and then there's also convalescent serum of recovered yeah. COVID patients that can be used to help treat. So for vaccines, Basically, the procedure is this. Um, scientists gather research. They sequence the viral genome mm -hmm. of COVID-19, or in the scientific community, they're calling it SARS-CoV-2. Mm. Um, that's what scientists to scientists, they're communicating it on. Um, so they do the research. They, um, they take pieces of the virus that... Um, that are not going to cause harm so they disabled the virus pretty much mm. and then um they first do animal testing on that when this is the beginning stages of creating the vaccine and right now the fda has approved them to do genetic engineering typically they inject these viral particles into chicken eggs and oh. then allow the embryos to grow the uh -huh. antibodies for the for the virus, um, but they're using genetic engineering. And uh, I think there's about a hundred different companies looking at mm. creating vaccines. And so um, once they've done animal studies, then they move on to testing it on humans uh -huh. and they'll, they'll select a group. But the, the vaccine itself, once injected into a patient, um, so it has these disabled viral particles that your immune system, you have lots of different cells in your immune system, but one of them is T cells and they come into contact with these viral particles in your blood mm -hmm. and the T cell takes it in and then it, it puts it kind of on the outer coating of your immune um, cells. Mm. So that it's kind of like a little coat of armor. Ah, and okay cells communicate with one another on the surface. They have these mm -hmm. proteins that I tell students, they're kind of like little antennas that can talk mm. with one another. And so that when um, you've received the vaccine, you have this kind of little armor on your T cells or your immune cells that are going to help fight off. And then if you were introduced to the virus, and that comes into contact with all of your cells that have this coat of armor, your, your immune cells are going to say, hey, wait, I know you. <laughs> I know you. I recognize you. <laughs> and you're not going to come inside. Yeah. So um, because the virus, the whole goal of the virus is to get inside the cell and then take over the machinery inside to mass produce. Yeah. Yeah, the viruses, and then it spreads from one cell to the next. So right. that the vaccine helps stop that, and it and it gives your body a chance to say, "Hey, wait a second! I've been introduced to you before, 
and no, you're not going to trick me and come inside my cells. <laughs> Jill, that was the best explanation <laughs> I've heard about <laughs> how a vaccine works. And I love thinking that there's these little armored, armored cells in there that are busy saying, no, you're bad news, out of here. <laughs> right. Okay, so it's good to know there are hundreds of vaccines that are being worked on right now. We just have to hope for uh, a safe one to emerge from the pack um, as soon as possible, although I know that we don't can't know when that will be. Right. Um, other, thank you for that. That was great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one other piece of good news after uh, listening to an, an, an immunologist talk about COVID specifically is that um, this virus is going to evolve very slowly. Uh -huh. which means that once we do have a vaccine, it should work for a while. Which that is, is very good news. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Jill, I'm, I'm curious to find out. I, I, I was wondering, have you, you've been busy teaching science um, until today is your last day, I understand. Uh, <laughs> although, as we were saying before the show began, summer vacation is not exactly the same <laughs> these days right. as it used to be. But have you been using the pandemic um, in your science classes? So believe it or not, we learned all about viruses and bacteria right before the pandemic. Oh, wow. Um, we certainly talked about it a little bit during our Zoom meetings or virtual meetings, but I, I didn't assign um, work on it just mm -hmm. because everyone was so inundated and yeah. the students were kind of, the morale was kind of low. I didn't yeah. want to. To, I didn't want to harp on it and I tried I get to, it. to stay positive and right. um, but it will certainly be you know next year I'm sure they'll have lots of questions and they did have a lot of questions when yeah. this all began. Yeah, I'll bet. Well the other thing I wanted to ask you uh, uh, is that with so many uh, parents having had to become homeschoolers <laughs> right now do you have suggestions about how they can get or keep i guess uh, more to the point since we all started as scientists uh get their children or keep their children interested in science absolutely there's so many uh choices out there for parents so um one i would say keep them in nature uh, take them to the beach, take them on hikes, let them, you know, lift up a rock and look at all the bugs, let them look at fungi growing on uh, the bark of trees and just investigate. There's a lot of really good, um, you can buy a butterfly kit and mm. have caterpillars come and then they metamorphosize into the butterflies and then you set the butterflies free. So little kits like that, that parents mm -hmm. can, can um, buy and then, um, you know, there's so many sources online and so many interesting science phenomena. And mm -hmm. one that I love to teach about is uh, glow in the dark animals. Mm. <laughs> oh. And, you know, right now at your pet stores are glow in the dark fish. So, you know, they could have one of those and then that yeah. opens up the, the opportunity to talk about, well, how did this even happen? And scientists isolated um, the protein in jellyfish that glows mm. the bioluminescence and then they've um, inserted it into the genome of various animals and they do uh. work. <laughs> So. Bioluminescence is a great word, don't you think? <laughs> I just, it's a great word. <laughs> oh, in other words, there's no, uh, there's no scarcity of um, no. kits and projects and all kinds of ways that would be fun, it sounds like to me, to work on together with your kids and, right. and, and uh, reinforce and re-enliven that early curiosity that we are all born with, as you were talking about earlier. Well, um, Jill, do you think that more students, um, now that they've gone through the pandemic um, and, and we're, we're living through this experiment right now in a, in, a, in a global pandemic, do you think more students are going to want to study life sciences after they've had this experience? I hope so. <laughs> I really hope so. Uh, and the reason being is that just even um, without the pandemic, in the future, three out of four Jill, we've lost your sound somehow. So, um, sorry, I can't hear you, Mary, but I'm gonna go ahead. So, um, 
three out of four jobs are going to be in the STEM field. Ah. And parents should really encourage their students, if they have a passion for science, definitely follow it because it will, it will serve them when they're older and they will probably end up working at a position where science, technology, or engineering is involved. So I highly encourage it. <laughs> Good. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jill. This has been wonderful. You've, you have performed many public services with your explanations today. And I thank you. And I'm, I have the feeling this won't be the last time that you'll have been on the, uh, the morning show. Thank you so much. So we're going to shift now and I'm going to welcome my next guest. Um, so I'm going to welcome Edith Maxwell and Sam Bailey onto the show now. And we'll see if we can get them onto the screen. Um, Edith Maxwell writes for, uh, writes mysteries. She writes the Quaker Midwife Mysteries and other series. She used to make her living um, as a writing technical documentation in the software industry. And she wrote features and essays. Her very first published story was actually at the age of nine. She's active in the Sisters in Crime and is also a member of the Mystery Writers of America. And of course, the reason she's here today is that she's a longtime member of the Society of Friends or Quakers and is the recent and past clerk of the Amesbury Friends meeting. There's Edith, hi. Hello. And Sam Bailey, let's see if we can get Sam on screen. Sam is an historian, hi Sam. And also a lifelong Quaker. He was originally from Philadelphia. He now lives in Exeter, New Hampshire. And he's also with Edith, a member of the Amesbury Friends meeting. So welcome Edith and welcome Sam. And thank you so much for visiting the morning show. It's good to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us, Mary. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Yes. So, Sam, can you hear me? I think you're Please. muted, Sam. If you can unmute. Yeah. That's Well, while we work on unmuting, Sam. It's at the bottom yeah. left. Yeah. Yeah. There should be, there's a little red microphone there. You just have, oh. it has a, there you How go. How about now? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Welcome. All right. I have can a you voice hear? now. <laughs> Good, excellent. It's always great. That, <laughs> well, you know, Edith and Sam, I, I'm an admirer of the Society of Friends who, to me, uh, I've always admired your proud history of putting your values into practice, making a direct link between spirituality and activism. Because it appears to me that the Friends have created, uh, have tapped into a force for integrity and good. So it seemed timely to invite you onto the show to talk about um, the Quakers' commitment to activism, especially given the emphasis these days on anti-racism and to peace activism. But I want to back up a little bit because I know that the Society of Friends has been around for centuries now and the Amesbury Meeting House has its own interesting historic pedigree. So I wanted to start out just by getting you to teach us a little bit about the origin story of the Friends. Uh, okay, I'm going to begin with the origin story. Excellent, Sam. Uh, you're right that Quakerism has been around for a long time, I would say for 360 or 70 years. Uh, and it started in mid-17th century England. And you have to think for a moment about mid-17th century England, which I'm sure everybody does. Uh, <laughs> we will now, Sam. <laughs> well, the century before was the Protestant Revolution and the Catholic Counter-Revolution. So it was a time in which religion was being uh, debated and struggled and challenged and all the rest. Uh, a period of great social, political, and religious upheaval and debate at all times. Questioning beliefs, seeking new answers. George Fox, who is really the uh, founder of Quakerism, he was the most charismatic and influential early Quaker, began preaching in 1647. Mm. Quakerism developed rapidly from then on. Quakers very quickly went to America. Mm -hmm. In 1656, the first Quakers went to the New World, to Boston and Rhode Island. Now, they arrived in Boston because this was the land of the Puritans who had 
mm. escape Europe for freedom of religion. However, the Puritans did not tolerate the Quakers. Uh, Something to keep in mind. They, they uh, weren't they, known for their toleration. <laughs> no, that exactly <laughs> right, Mary. Uh, and, and they, <laughs> right. So uh, they persecuted the Quakers mm -hmm. in 1656 to 1660. Four Quakers were hung mm -hmm. on the Boston Commons. Mm -hmm. One was Mary Dyer. And if any of you go to the Commons and you look to the right as you go into the entrance, there's a statue of Mary Dyer, mm -hmm. who was a very devout young Quaker uh, who was hung because of her religious beliefs. Mm. The uh, Quakers responded to this by moving around. They got out of Boston and they went to places like Rhode Island mm. and also to Amesbury. Mm. And so that is how the Quakers ended up in Amesbury. <laughs> well, that's really interesting, Sam. So it was partly a diaspora um, that was prompted by persecution. Yes. That's right. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And well, I want to just add a note yeah. about Margaret Fell, who is considered the mother of Quakerism. Mm -hmm. And she got to know George Fox very early on. And um, after her husband died, she ended up marrying George Fox. So she's Margaret Fell Fox, but oh. she argued strongly for women's equality back there in the 1600s. Um, in, and, and Edith, yeah. not many people were doing that <laughs> in right. the 1600s, right. so, so good for her. <laughs> she had a proto-feminist. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's so, great. Um, and the Amesbury Meeting House that you mentioned, yeah. um, there, were Ames, there were Quakers in Amesbury since, I think, around 1710, right, Sam? Mm -hmm. And, um, or maybe before that, but the first meeting house in Amesbury was built in 1710. Mm -hmm. And then there was another one built in 1803. Um, but they sort of outgrew that. And one of their mm -hmm. members donated land at the corner of what is now Friend Street and Greenleaf Street. Mm -hmm. And um, they built the meeting house that was finished in 1850. And our Quaker poet and abolitionist, John Greenleaf Whittier, was on the building committee. So he uh, also okay. saw, he had input into the building, the tall, plain windows, mm -hmm. and um, oversaw the building process. Mm -hmm. So it does have a very distinguished pedigree. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, I wanted to ask, I just love the name Society of Friends because it's so welcoming and warm. And, and I wonder if you could explain the importance of friendship and community to the expression of Quaker faith. Sure. I mean, that name came from, it was the Religious Society of Friends of the Truth oh, back okay. in Fox and Fells Day. Mm -hmm. um, um, but certainly community is a huge part of our, our practice and our beliefs. Um, in Amesbury, we're very welcoming. People are, when new people come, they always say, I can't believe how nice everybody was to me. Everybody got, <laughs> made me feel so welcome. And we have fellowship after worship. And um, so it, it is a very big part. And we try to expand our circles of friendship to include, include the rest of the community and worldwide, it's really a part of our values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, well, I also was curious, you hear the expression, the inward guide in reference to, um, to the Quakers. And I was hoping that you could explain to us what the inward guide means and what role the inward guide plays in individual spiritual life as well as the spiritual life of the group. Sure. Uh, the inward guide, we use the term inward light, uh, mm -hmm. inner light. Uh, it's mm -hmm. essentially the same thing we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it is the most important concept related to Quakerism. Mm. It's the fundamental belief in Quakerism. Everything else, all our beliefs, all our testimonies and other things come ultimately from this belief. And what is the belief? That of God in all people. Mm. It is the seed of divinity in all people. Mm. It is the basis of a direct experience with God. No intermediary necessary. Yeah. No, minis yeah. no ministers, no doctrine. The inner light is the ultimate authority. Yeah. 
Okay. And it's something that, um, that we all have. Access Everybody, to, that's, that's we exactly all have the point. Divinity Every within single, us. Yeah. I must confess that that sometimes is hard to uh, continue to believe, but I'll let that go right there. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. All right. It's a, yeah. Well, you know, um, you also, from the reading I've done, um, are dogma free and credo free and commandment free, but certainly not free of shared values. And you talk about testimonies and Sam, you just used that word testimonies. And I, I, I was hoping that you could also define the testimonies and, and how they work to define or unite um, what it means to be a Quaker. Sure. Uh, there are five testimonies uh, which serve as uh, general guidelines for people. And they are, as I said, the result. Everyone is the result of the belief in the inner light. Mm. The first of those is equality. Mm. If everyone has the inner light, then all must be equal. Women, right. men, blacks, whites, native, Asians, etc. Mm -hmm. The second of the testimonies is peace. Mm. How could you kill the divine spark? in oh. someone else. The third is simplicity. Really the idea here is excessive materialism of possessions divides societies rather than unites societies. Mm -hmm. The fourth is integrity, which is basically complete honesty with others, but also with the self. Mm -hmm. And that is the key to spiritual growth. And the fifth is community. Here the emphasis is on listening, listening to everyone, following the dictates of the inner light and leading to unity through that commitment to the dictates of the inner light. So those are the five, equality, peace, simplicity, integrity, community. Sam, I, I just get a, a warm feeling in my heart hearing you talk about those. That's really wonderful. And they're totally internally coherent and consistent. So thank you for that. That makes perfect sense to me. And, and, uh, uh, and it, it's just re really inspiring to hear. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about was, I, I know that you don't have ministers. You made reference to that before. So, so what kind of, of, leadership um, do you have um, in a religion without leadership, <laughs> without ministers, <laughs> so to speak? Well, again, coming back to that there is that of God in each of us, yeah. we, minis we minister to each other. Yeah. So we don't have one person in charge. We do have a ministry and council, that's SEL, committee that tends to sort of the pastoral needs of the of the community um, and leads religious education for adults and things like that. But, um, and we have a monthly business meeting and there is a clerk of the meeting mm -hmm. who is, if anybody's in charge, the clerk is in charge, like when it comes right <laughs> down to it. Um, I mean, I was clerk some years ago the, for the first time and a, a couple got married in our meeting house under care of our meeting. So we uh -huh. were shepherding them through. And somebody, <laughs> somebody has to sign the marriage license. So oh, Okay, that's the clerk. <laughs> that's what the clerk okay. does. But, but it's really the conduct, the, yeah. the, worship, the worshipful conduct of the business meeting. Yeah. Um, that's about as much structure as we have. There's structure on the regional level too, but um, yeah. for our meeting, that's what we have. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And also seems consistent with, with, with everything else you've been saying. So yes. I, I wanted to ask too, you don't have um, missionaries or recruiters. And so I wondered how you find new members. And, and for that matter, how did each of you discover your spiritual home as a, as a Quaker? Yeah, you're right. That's partly, the fact that we don't recruit actively, we don't evangelize, um, is partly why our numbers are a little low. <laughs> um, um, I've, I happened, I, years ago when I was in graduate school in Indiana, I went to a Quaker meeting with a boyfriend. Ah. And it was, it was an unprogra unprogrammed meeting like ours is. And I thought, oh, 
I like this. I, <laughs> you know, I had grown up sort of nominally Presbyterian. I mean, not a, not a really active church family. And um, I really felt at home. And when I found my way to Amesbury meeting 31 years ago, I, I absolutely knew I'd found my spiritual home. After 31 years, I'd say that's a, that's a safe, <laughs> that's <right. laughs> safe to say you found a good fit. Well, you mentioned the meeting and it was clearly pivotal in, in your um, sorting out that that's where you belong. I was hoping that you could describe, especially for people who've never been to a meeting, what happens at one? I've been to one and it was, I was raised Catholic and it was kind of the antithesis, antithesis <laughs> of a Catholic mass. Um, and I found it very, very peaceful indeed. Um, but could you describe um, um, what goes on um, or what doesn't go on um, at a meeting? So outwardly, I think you mentioned in your question, it looks like nothing's happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And in our kind of meeting, there are meetings who have uh, pastors who have sermons, but ours, most of the New England meetings do not. And we do sit in silence um, for an hour and if someone feels moved by a message from God, they stand and share it. And then there's more silence. Um, but it's not a discussion group. It's not a therapy group. Um, so outwardly, it can look like nothing's happening. And we don't have songs unless someone is moved to song, to song by, by the light. But Sam's going to talk about inwardly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so... Well, you know, trying to describe in an effective way what happens in a meeting is difficult. Mm. And one reason is that it's unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Almost every other religion I know has a service and they have somebody leading that service and they have a program so that when people go, they know what to expect. And also, so, and in addition to being unfamiliar with the Quaker thing, it's unscripted. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing written down for us. So there's no program. But I think it's a matter of the way people relate to each other who mm. come. It's the group that sits there. They come in expectant waiting. Some for the divine, others for the spirit. We use different words to describe mm -hmm. it. But there's a spirit of love. Uh, there's a spirit of sharing with those in the room. There's an energy. It's not noise, the absence of noise. It's not silence as the absence of noise. Mm -hmm. It is silence that is filled with energy mm. and communication and love for each mm. other. Very much. Yeah. Oh, Sam, that is so well put. And I love the distinction between the lack of noise and the construction of the silence. It's really a <laughs> yes. kind of a, a receptivity to other kinds of still energy. So that's yes. really, yeah. that's yeah. really yeah. lovely and very well put. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, your, your services are serene and relaxing and your connection to the divine is inward, but your values, I have to say, and what I'm impressed with and, uh, and admiring of, they're outspoken in actively serving the community. So I was hoping that you could connect the uh, spiritual dots, so to speak, um, between the <laughs> essence of Quaker spirituality and the result and commitment to activism. I know, um, Edith, that in one blog post I read of you, 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 you talked about um, the Friends being historically rabble rousers in the name of <laughs> peace and equality, <laughs> which I just love. So uh, could you talk a little bit about the connection between the Quakers' um, spirituality and their activism? Sure. Um, I mean, back from those early days when they were doing what they weren't supposed to do. They weren't paying taxes and they weren't going to the Puritan church. And um, um, on through it, it, in the United States, particularly, but elsewhere, of course, um, all the major um, social justice movements, Quakers were at the forefront of the abolitionists, yeah. including John Greenleaf Whittier. Mm -hmm. um, women's suffrage, Almost all of those major players in women's suffrage at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century were Quakers. Um, peace and anti-war activism. Um, Quakers have done alternative service, become conscientious objectors, um, started the um, 
American Friend, American Friends Service Committee, mm -hmm. um, which came out of being ambulance drivers as alternative service, mm. and is still a very socially active, um, um, social rights act active group, um, national. Um, mm. We, I think it was a Quaker who started the Alternatives to Violence program, which brings um, um, peace techniques into prisons. Yeah. And, and conflict resolution into prisons. Other people uh -huh. do it too, of course, now, but that's a really important one. So it's really, um, we're, we all aspire to be risky Quakers, you know, to, <laughs> to go and demonstrate and, and possibly get in trouble for it. <laughs> that's that rabble-rousing spirit. It for is. For the centuries. <laughs> it is, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned the American Friends Service Committee. I remember going back to anti-Vietnam War protests, how active they were in those days. Mm -hmm. And I've heard of alternatives to violence, too. And I, had, I, I believe you're right that the Quakers were involved in, in getting that going. Are there other ways um, that um, the Friends or your meeting house in particular, or members of it, are currently feeling called to action? Well, um Pretty much, there have been Quakers represented at the current Black Lives Matter demonstrations yeah. and the anti-gun violence days. Um, yeah. Sam and his wife Joan have been very active in getting the word out about that and wearing orange the first weekend in June. Mm -hmm. um, um, those are just yeah. two that come to mind yeah. right now that that friends are active in right now. Yeah. Sam, well, I, more, if I could just if yeah. I could just add there. Um, Environment is another big issue that we're yeah. all involved yeah. in, we're thinking yeah. through. And another is the sanctuary movement. Mm. Right. Uh, our, our meeting is in partnership with the Main Street Congo Church in setting mm. up a sanctuary there mm -hmm. for an immigrant. Uh, there are difficulties with the um, coronavirus, but nevertheless, we're working on that and we feel very committed to the rights of, of those people. Mm. Right, absolutely. There's, there's one other thing I just wanted to mention. Quakers um, are conscientious objectors. Mm -hmm. And what conscientious objectors means is that they object to serving in the military. But it doesn't mean not serving your country or your ideals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What it means is you do alternate service, mm -hmm. usually international. So, for example, when I graduated from college, I spent the next two years living and working in a Mexican village hmm. under the auspices of the American Friends Service Committee, hmm. doing the kind of work they needed in terms of, uh, of uh, diet and planting trees and uh, latrines and uh, pure water, anything hmm. that needed to be done we worked there with the people who were yeah. there to do it. So mm -hmm. alternate service is a positive way of yeah. dealing the thing. And it was done through the draft board. Mm -hmm. I mean, I registered the draft as a conscientious objector and then worked out doing that. I just yeah. wanted to mention that. No, I'm, I'm glad that you did. There's many ways to serve your country. The distinction you make, it doesn't have to be through the military. Right. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, this is your opportunity, what, <laughs> what's the biggest misconception um, that you think people have about the Quakers? Because uh, you can set it to right, <laughs> you can dispel it right now. <laughs> well, we're not Amish and we're not Shakers. <laughs> like, okay, let it be known. <laughs> people so often, they say, oh, I love your Amish mysteries. I go, I don't write Amish mysteries. You know, we, we don't drive buggies. We use electricity. Um, yeah. We're not Shakers. We're not celibate. We're not, you know, like, so um, th I think those are, those are two. I mean, it's funny, but you would be surprised how many people think, oh, you're the Amish. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, uh, right. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Fair enough. Um, Could well, I just add, add Yeah, a word please there? do, Sam. Uh, Absolutely. I do have a uh, concern, uh, a misconception. And people have said to me all my life, oh, you're a pacifist. Mm. That means basically you do nothing. Mm. And I want to point out that Quakers are about the most active pacifists yeah. I've ever seen in the world. Yeah. They're a terribly active group. 
the trick is they're expressing it in different ways and or it's perceived sometimes as passive. That's, That's an excellent point. point, Sam. And it strikes me that just as um, silence isn't the same as the absence of sound, passivism is not the same as apathy by any means. In fact, right. it takes an awful lot of energy to remain peaceful and to advocate for peace and to create peace wherever you go, it strikes me. So it's kind of the opposite of apathy. So thanks for making that distinction. Mm. Um, well, um, I, you know, I, I have to say, I, I've heard a lot of people, especially these days, um, with all the protests and the turmoil that's going on, say, well, I wish I knew how to be more active. And I guess I'd say to anybody wondering, go hang out with the Quakers. <laughs> and they'll help you figure out a way to do it, or you can just join in with them. So um, I did want, um, uh, Edith, though, I, I know that you have um, a mystery series uh, that features, uh, you have different series, you're, you're very prolific, but you do have one, the Quaker Midwife series, which are set in Amesbury. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to end, Matt, ask you, um, what role does Quakerism play in the murder mysteries that you write? Well, my main character is a late 1880s midwife who is a Quaker, uh -huh. and um, she worships in the same meeting house where we do, when we can. Um, and she has a very strong sense of justice Mm. and she, it, integrity and um so she has become an amateur sleuth i mean she's a midwife she does prenatal care she delivers babies she catches babies but she also um now is by I'm, I'm writing the seventh book right now and wow. um she actually the police ask her for help by now because they know she's really good yeah. and she can she can go places the police can't go she goes yeah. into women women's bed chambers. So she can hear secrets and find out things that the male police could never do. But it's really her, um, it's really her Quaker values that govern her, the way she conducts her life. Mm -hmm. um, and Whittier is a character in the books. So oh, wonderful. He's sort of a, <laughs> kind of a behind the scenes mentor to her and a wise, a local <laughs> wise man. And so we see him too. Wonderful. And Edith, if people want to learn more about your mysteries, could you just say what your website is? Oh, sure. EdithMaxwell.com. Easy to remember. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Edith and Sam, thank you both so much. Um, everything you've said has just uh, made me admire the Quakers um, even more. I really appreciate your taking the time to come on the show. It couldn't be more timely, I think, to learn more about the Quakers and your um, your fabulous and distinguished history as rabble rousers, which clearly continues in its peaceful, <laughs> specific way into the present. Thank you so much. It's been a joy to have you on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, that's it Thank for today's you. show, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you'll join us next Thursday on the morning show when I'm so excited to welcome historian and biographer Kate Larson, the author of Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero. We're going to talk about some of the lesser known but still extraordinary accomplishments of this great American, as well as Kate's work as a consultant on the award-winning film Harriet. But we're also going to talk about the concept of the usable past, as it's called, and how history is written, and why so often post-Civil War historical narratives have obscured the horrors of slavery, and why they also consigned Harriet Tubman to a subject primarily of juvenile biographies until Kate Larson's biography. Um, and bringing history closer to home, I'll also welcome Jance, Jack Santos to talk about this year's pandemic version of the wonderful If This House Could Talk project. That's it for the day, everybody. Um, we will see you next week on The Morning Show.